Hi, I'm Dr. Nicole Glazer, a pediatric endocrinologist and professor of pediatrics at UC Davis and author of Changes in Serum Sodium Concentration and Mental Status in Children with Diabetic Ketoacidosis. This study was a planned sub-analysis of the PCARN fluid trial, a large multi-center prospective study. In that study, we identified patients at NDKA at 13 children's hospitals across the United States to determine if the type and rate of fluids administered could cause adverse events in children. The bottom line from that study was treat the child in front of you. Fluid rate and type does not cause cerebral injury. In this study, we dive into sodium and its impact in children with DKA. DKA protocols often include close sodium monitoring and fluid adjustment to keep sodium in a narrow range due to concern that the change in osmolality may cause cerebral edema and cerebral injury. However, associations between declines in serum sodium and risk of cerebral injury has not been confirmed in a prospective study. Cerebral injury is the term we came to use in place of cerebral edema because it's more inclusive to the clinically important changes in the brain that can occur during DKA, not just edema. We wanted to know which factors influence changes in serum sodium concentrations during treatment and whether these changes were associated with mental status changes and risk of cerebral injury during DKA treatment. We corrected the sodium for the glucose value. To answer these questions, we monitored GCS and glucose hourly, electrolytes every two to four hours, and we recorded diagnoses of clinically apparent cerebral injury and tested short-term memory every four hours while the children were awake. We compared patients who had a decline in sodium at any time interval with the patients who had no change in sodium or an increase, and compared GCS and short-term memory between groups. Then we used multivariable logistic regression models to determine factors that influence changes in sodium concentrations during treatment and to compare mental status changes between groups. We found that higher initial sodium and chloride concentrations, previous diagnosis of diabetes, and assignment to the half-normal saline treatment arms were significantly associated with declines in sodium at all time points. This last point is key because the type of fluids we give is the only variable we can modify as providers. More rapid infusion of fluids was associated with declines in sodium concentrations only at the 12-hour time point. But there were no differences in the frequencies of decline in GCS between patients who had a decrease in sodium concentration and those in whom the sodium concentration increased or remained stable. And rates of cerebral injury were also similar in the two groups. What does this mean for those of us who care for individuals with DKA? Well, this study does a little myth busting and shows that sodium is not as important as we once thought it was. It takes the pressure off clinicians in trying to keep the sodium in a narrow window and frees up time to concentrate on other important aspects of care. The type of fluids administered, half normal versus normal saline, impacted the sodium concentration, but the rate did not. So if you want to change the sodium, change the fluid type, but not the rate. Finally, declines in sodium were not associated with altered mental status during DKA treatment or clinically apparent cerebral injury. I hope that this information is helpful for the care of your future patients with DKA. Bottom line, the serum sodium matters less than we thought in DKA management. Thanks and follow us at PCARN team for more PCARN myth busting.